isn't it? Greenville's great. Greenville is a beautiful little town. Love that town. Did you play in the uh, 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 that league out there? No, I didn't play in that league, but uh, I had young minor league clients who played at Greenville. Oh, that's gorgeous. That's the Red Sox organization. What they did to that town, Joe, what they did to that town is, is, is really gorgeous. Well, I never, really saw, I never saw the before picture, but I saw the after picture, and it's fantastic. Oh, yeah. You should see the, uh, uh, like the baseball fields in like Asheville, North Carolina. Yes. You know, the, Excuse me, God. Uh, yeah, Asheville I played in. Did you like uh, uh, those leagues there? Did you like that? Yeah, for a year. You don't want to stay there too long. No, 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 no. You don't want to stay there. But I played, after- I played in the Southern League, you know, and a lot of – it's it's interesting. A lot of those teams that are in uh, – that were double-A teams when I played, Asheville. Yeah. There were a couple – that are now A-ball teams. Correct. Yeah, and actually I don't uh, – I haven't done – a whole lot of research yet to figure out where where the teams are now because there's a lot of changes this winter. Oh, baseballs! I mean, they got rid of what Billy? How many get, uh, teams did they get rid of? Like 40, 50 About teams? forty teams. Really? Yeah. So they, they got a-, a lot of less ball players, correct? They do. That's why there are so many available solid players for independent teams and all these other teams. They have these other uh, leagues for the prospects and the draft leagues. And uh, it's it's quite interesting. Really? So it's really changed an awful yeah. lot. I mean, uh, you know what? I hate to tell you, Joe, I don't yes. care what anybody says. The time we played is the best time in the world, big guy. I don't care what anybody says. We didn't make much money. Yeah. We didn't make much money, but we sure had a good time. Yeah, I, um, I always tell people the best job in the world. You know, just being fortunate enough to get the opportunity to do it. And then if things work out, my God. Well, you know, I, I live my dream. I, I, do too. I, yeah. I live my dream. I got, I had an opportunity to live my dream and it worked out for me. And I could never have planned it any better than I did. Better yeah. than it happened, than it unfolded. Well, yeah. And not only that, you know, one of the great things, um, about having Joe, Joe with us tonight. Um, you know, I mean, he was an all-star pitcher with Houston in 1980. Um, he was a Cy Young Award can- candidate in 81. Um, and then the Red Sox in 86, you know, they were going for it. They, they really, um, they, they had some pieces that they had to fill. Um, and and they went out and they got experienced guys that, you know, with winning pedigrees and they needed a lefty for, for the bullpen. And, you know, they went out and got Joe and, um, you know, I, I think Joe had 12 saves, uh, two, two and oh record. I mean, he was made to order much in the same way that they needed the, you know, the big veteran righty. And they went out and they got Tom Seaver. Um, they needed a veteran shortstop. They went out in August and got Spike Owen. Um, so, you know, um, it, it, it's just great to have a part of the team that, would, that, that, that was so critical in, in what the Red Sox were trying to do that year. They were truly going for it. Um, and they went out and they got the veterans. Don, Donnie Baylor is another one um, that, had success in the past and that rubs off on the younger guys doesn't it joe it absolutely does and you know i was looking at some numbers today i didn't realize baylor hit 31 home runs that season he did you know he had more home runs than anybody else on our on our team but i just didn't realize he had hit that many or i didn't recall it that way um but and and what a prince of a guy oh yeah i started my career with him clubhouse leader Oh yeah. The day he walked in. Let me tell you, when the, when he walked in, everybody knew who the leader of the team was. Correct. In 67, when I signed with the Yankees, he was the number two draft choice by the Orioles mm-hmm. that year. And what and, and we started, I started in Johnson City, Tennessee. He started in a uh, Bluefield, West Virginia. And uh, what a guy. The only thing that he did not have is an arm. He yes. couldn't throw. You're right. That's the only thing he never had was his arm. Yeah. But I mean, fast as lightning. Mm-hmm. 
hitting. He was a really a good fielder, but he just couldn't throw. Yeah. But outside of that, I mean, he was, to me, I mean, he was one of the best. It was him and Bobby Gritch and Kenny Singleton and all those guys. Mm-hmm. And it was really a, a, a good time. I, I used to watch you, you know, when you had your good years up in uh, Houston, and I used to watch you when you came in relief, you had super stuff. I mean, you really did. Thank I you. mean, having a left-handed pitcher that threw strikes and you could be wild once in a while that you wanted to be wild. And that was good back then. And you know how to pitch somebody. Nowadays, you have to go right here. You have to go from uh, up to the neck down to the chest. You can't move around anymore. You can't do that. You're right. It's um, the hitters. I, the, the hitters are better now. You know what it is? I, they're, they're stronger. They're bigger and they're stronger and they can handle the bat, have more control over the bat. And uh, I know there were um, – I knew how to back a guy off the plate without hitting him, we'll say, just to set up maybe the next pitch or the pitch after that. And I was thinking about that today uh, as I was going through some names and Buckner came up. Buckner was the toughest left-handed hitter I faced Mm -hmm. because I couldn't back him up. And he he would hang in there and he'd wait for that pitch outside that I'd eventually throw because I had to go somewhere else. You know, I try to back them up, you know, and I could back, I back them out of the box with the pitch, but he'd come right back in there and he was right up on the plate again. He was a tough out. You know, what's, I tell you what, so people remember one play of a ball player. People don't realize when he was with the Dodgers, number one, I mean, he was a great first baseman. I mean, really a good first baseman. He could hit with the best of them. He could play. They remember one thing, and that's, and Eric, you know, you probably really uh, uh, got, you know, all the ball players to really find out about it. And, you know, I mean, I'm really, hey, first thing, I'm really happy to have y'all. I really am. You know, Joe, Eric, Billy, you know, I'm really happy to have y'all. And it's really, really great. Uh, I've had Eric uh, uh, once before when he had uh, um, Sham's book. Um, and I really never met you before, but I saw you pitched an awful lot of times. And, and you know, I mean, you had great stuff and you really did. And uh, yeah, especially being a left-hander that has control and you had control and you knew how to pitch. And Billy is a guy that's been in baseball for so long, he's 15 years old. And he has more expensive equipment than all of us together. <laughs> so let me ask you something, Billy. Come on, talk about it. Come on. I appreciate it. Us. No, thank you. I appreciate you having me on too. It means a lot. Uh, you know, uh, I definitely have to ask though about that uh, 86 team. Was there a lot of hype before the season? I wasn't around back then. So was there a lot of hype or was there a certain point in the season that, you know, you realize that we could do something special in the postseason? Well, you know, I was the new kid on the block. I signed with the Red Sox. uh, I don't know. It was January, February um, and came to camp. Actually, I was a non-roster player in camp because I had, I had, uh, I was coming back from elbow surgery and I spent the winter in Venezuela just trying to attract attention and hope somebody saw me throw and liked it enough to give me a try. And uh, the Red Sox and the Cardinals were the two teams that knocked on the door after I was done in Venezuela. And uh, they both, they both made offers. Uh, The the, um, Cardinals had uh, Whitey Herzog. They had a good team. Whitey Herzog was the manager and he was a, he was always a fan of mine. Uh, you know, we'd always banter through the years. And, uh, and he, he called me, you know, he's the one that called me from the Cardinals and said, let's, you got to come over here. We need a guy like you. And, and then uh, the Red Sox called and I had to sit down and make a decision. And I looked at the roster. Cardinals had about five lefty bullpen guys on their roster. And, 
and the Red Sox had one. Yeah. And I said, I'm going the path of least resistance for sure. <laughs> <on this one." laughs> you know, so I went in and uh, fortunately for me, um, we played the Red Sox and the tight and the Tigers were only 20 minutes apart in spring training. And so it seemed like we were playing them every day and they had a lineup full of lefties. And I was, <laughs> They always threw me out there against the lefties, you know, and um, I, I would joke with uh, Terry Francona. He was one of those lefties. And I would always joke with him and I'd thank him. Because I said, you know, I made the Red Sox team and eventually got to a World Series because I got you out every time I faced you in the, in the spring. <laughs> so, but that was, that was key. That's what they were looking for was a lefty to get a lefty out. Right. And, and I was able to do that pretty consistently and that's what it's all about is consistency we see a lot of those lefty specialists but now it seems like they're not as important because of the new rule with mlb you have to face three batters how do you yeah. think that's affecting the game well i don't like it i don't like when they're playing with the rules i mean because yeah. look i played baseball a long time ago and it was played in a certain way and and these rules for me i i always say no nah, i think our we were better or i think it was better left alone because it seems like baseball rules have been that way since they started. They, there are very few changes. And, you know, that rule that was it three hitters now? Or three hitters. Inning? Is it three innings? Uh, three hitters or finish an inning? I believe so. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess if you can get a, get a guy to hit into a double play and end an inning, then I guess you're okay. Whatever. But, um, I don't, I don't like that new rule. Yeah. I, think, I think there's a place for the lefty reliever, we'll say, the lefty situation guy. Yeah. What do you think, Ron? Do you think he, uh, you were a lefty facing those guys? Was it uh, tough? What do you think about the new rule? Well, I, you know, I mean, I hate all these new rules that they put in the game like it is. You know, I mean, hey, I, I remember when we started, you know, Joe and myself, I mean, we played the baseball like Abner Doubleday started the game of baseball. Now it's it's to me it's it's a game of uh, 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 it's a video game to me. You know, I mean, I'm looking at this because this is going on the 48th year to be the first for the DH uh, 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 April the sixth of uh, in April, right? 48 years. You can't tell me that the National League cannot make a decision about the DH. And they doing everything about, they, they put in a, somebody at second base with the tied score with an extra inning game. You can't have the shift anymore. Uh, you, you, I mean, you, you, you know, you can't run into second base. You know, Joe, I mean, you know, I mean, how many times, you know, I mean, you know, double plays. The, the guy that runs into second base is running all the way out to center field. He, he, you know, I mean, you know, you, you can't hit the catcher. You know, that that's baseball to me. I'm sorry, and I understand that these guys make so much money. Hey, all these guys getting injured anyway and not having any of this stuff. So eventually, I think some reason the game is going to go back to the way it is because it's more to me it's a it's 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 a game of non-pitching now people rely everything on offense it's a home run or a strikeout there's no people don't talk about rbis they don't talk about batting practice about about uh, uh, batting averages they don't talk about a guy running from first to third anymore they don't talk about a sacrifice fly anymore. They don't talk about a drag butt or suicide squeeze. If you ask half the people out there, what is a suicide squeeze? Eric, they don't know what it is, do they? Oh. <laughs> no, they don't. When was uh, the last time they had a suicide squeeze? I, it's a good point. Um, I mean, I would say the game started to change a little bit um, in the early 80s um, when really, you know, the Yankees would use their starting pitchers, you know, for five or six innings, and then they would go to their bullpen and, and, and just use the matchups. That, that was the first significant change that I saw. Um, but then 
like you said, with all these rule cha changes um, that have got, got, gone on, you know, like the length of the game, I think is the biggest issue. Mm -hmm. And if I were running the game and I don't know how Joe feels about this. In fact, I'd love to hear um, Joe's com comments, but if I were commissioner of baseball, I think one solution to the length of these games would be to limit um, the number of pitchers that you have on your roster, like ca cap it at 11 or 12. That way managers, you know, won't be tempted to make all these pitching changes. Now I know that they're addressing that with the three batter rule, um, but I'm not sure if it's enough. I mean, we saw some games last year, you know, that were, you know, two to one games where you'd have 14 pitchers and the length of the game for a two to one game was, you know, three and a half, three hours, 40 minutes. Nobody wants to sit through that. I, I mean, I can't tell you how many of the, um, of the of the ball players that I interview, um, you know, from the '70s and '80s, that don't watch baseball anymore. It, it's 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 just too long. So that's when I think the game started to change in the early '80s. Um, but certainly now, um, I mean, the sacrifice fun hitting behind the runner. Um, I remember how Thurman Munson was a master at that. Yeah, right. you know, he he'd give himself up and. It probably cost him 25 points off his batting average. Um, but he was such a team player like so many others were. So, I mean, this is a whole other show. <laughs> but, uh, but those are my feelings on it. Yeah, if I may. Um, I think the driving force behind this movement to change rules really had a lot to do with the speed of the game or the time, the, the game time, the game length. Um, I remember as a player, we started our night games in Houston at 8.05. And it was like clockwork. I was eating our post-game meal down in our clubhouse at 10.20. Wow. See, and, and that's, I mean, we had good pitching. You know, and many times we were able to shorten the, the time of a game. But sorry about that, gang. Um, but uh, I think that's, that's the, that was the problem with that. The younger people wanted something that was uh, that moved along quicker, had a little bit more action, and the small ball got lost. But that is so very important. I remember, I remember, you know, bunt defense, bunt plays that would be put on from the dugout. You know, we got – Okay, we have uh, first and second, nobody out, a one-run lead in the ninth. Of course, now, you know, they're going to bunt. They're going to try to get those two guys over. And we're, we're playing a chess game in the infield, maybe a pickoff to second, you know, and then uh, when, the, when the bunt is laid down, where's the play? Is it, are we going to first or are we going to get the guy at third? Well, it depends which way, where it was hit and how you feel that coming off the mound. I mean, it was – it's it's a lot of the a lot of, I guess strategy and and I always felt that those last two innings could make you know obviously it does it makes the whole game and I'm, I miss that part and you're right now it seems like it's home run or striking because everybody everybody can hit the ball out even even your second baseman and if I re I recall. Uh, many of the shortstops were smaller guys. They ran well, but they were smaller guys. And, you know, there were times when guys would come up to the plate and I'd say, hey, I'm going to just take the bat out of his hand. If I can throw this hard enough where I want, I'm going to break that bat in half. And that's what I did, or that's what I tried to do. Sometimes it worked. But I didn't have to worry about a guy going deep on me unless it was Mike Schmidt. Yep. You know? Let me ask you something, Eric. Let me ask you a question now. Okay, you're a writer now. Okay, Billy, you're 21 years old. What do you think about the analytical part of the game? Do you like it? I'm talking about you. You're the younger person in the game now. You understand analytics. Do you like it, Eric? Do you you like the analytics? Well, uh, to a point. Um, 
One of the other books I wrote, um, I co-wrote Davy Johnson's autobiography. Um, so, I, you know, obviously, I, you know, when you write an autobiography with somebody, you, you know, you know them almost as well as anybody. Um, and Davy and I, we talked an awful lot about sabermetrics. And, and Davy really was the one that brought that into baseball on a large scale. He was the first guy that had a computer um, in the manager's office. And, you know, I had a conversation with him about, you know, where it's gone, where now managers, it's, it's like they don't make a move without referring to um, statistics. Like there's no feel for the game anymore. And even though Davey relied heavily on statistics, he still went with his gut. And I think that's what's missing from the game. You know, like, you, you know, I think the best example and, you know, I'm sure this is going to make, you know, you and Joe just ill just remembering this um, and Billy probably too. But, you know, the last game of the World Series last fall, um, you know, the Rays pitcher is just lights out. I mean, he's, he's Sandy Koufax out there, but, you know, because of analytics, um, he couldn't go out there and face the Dodgers for the third time around the lineup. And I'm like this, and you know, what I'm hoping for Ron is that that, uh, what they call it, jump, jumping the shark from Fonzie. You know, like that hopefully will change the mentality of going by the book all the time. My good Lord, this, he was, I, I mean, he was lights out and they pull him um, in the, I think it was the sixth inning I mean, the Dodgers were doing cartwheels. Yep. Um, so in that respect, I don't like where the extent of where analytics has taken us. Um, I do think there's a place for it um, with matchups. I know, you know, Reggie Jackson couldn't hit Paul Splittorf. And, um, you know, so I get that. But... Um, I just think it's gone way, way too far. Yeah. If I may. Yeah. That specific instance, I was pulling my hair up. I, oh, because, yeah. <laughs> because that kid, that guy was throwing the ball. I mean, he was throwing so well. He was, he was inducing swings and misses, not even foul balls, not hard hit grounders at, at any fielders. It's swings and misses. And if a pitcher wants any – weapon while he's out on the mound it's swing and a miss right it tells you a whole lot about what's going on once he lets go of the ball and and I remember I was texting with one of my former teammates and my text to him was what would Nolan have done oh. in that instance <laughs> you know it, it, you would turn to turn the manager around and said you go sit down and I'll talk to you later so. Oh, I, I hate to tell you how many times I've seen Catfish, where Billy Martin will come out and Catfish is throwing and Thurman is walking out and talking to Catfish and, Thur and Catfish, first thing he tells Billy, go, I'm pitching. There's no way I'm coming out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Jim Palmer, could you picture Bob Gibson, Jim Palmer, Gaylord Perry, Steve Carlton, you're telling these, you're yeah. telling these guys, you know, I tell you when I cannot pitch anymore. Yep. That's what they used to do. They want the ball in their hands on the seventh, eighth, and hopefully the ninth inning. If they and, don't, you know, and, you got a relief pitcher. And most and, managers want that same thing too. Yeah. And you're pitching, you're throwing 120 pitches. Now, you know, you got a pitch count of 40, 50 pitches. After 40, 50 pitches, the the manager will come out and the pitcher he has a ball and he knows what the uh, 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 manager is going to do. He has a ball in his hand. He gives it right to the uh, manager and he walks on off. But remember, remember years ago, the, uh, the best four or five pitchers you had were your starters. Yeah. And the goal was for that guy to get through nine. Mm -hmm. Right. And the only reason he came out was that he got in so much trouble that they had to go to someone else. Correct. And in, in, in those cases, if your best four or five of the starters, then 
your worst four or five are in the bullpen. So do I get rid of the guy that I really can count on, take him out of the game, and bring in one of my lesser pitchers in a hot, in a hot situation? You know, it's, uh, it's just the way it went. I want my best guy out there. I'm not going to bring in pitcher number eight to take care of uh, a mess that pitcher number one got into. You give you give that guy the chance to work out. It's it's just a different game. Now we have specialists. We have guys they groom and they develop relief pitchers in the minor leagues. Yeah. It wasn't that way years ago, as you know. No, no, you have to pitch. You know, right. you came up as a starter, right? No, you, you came know, up as I was a starter all through my minor league career. Yeah. And in the big leagues, I um, I started four games my first year. You know, out of I, I think I was in 20 games that year. I came up All Star break, and so I started four games there. I started one game in my second season, and then that was it. I didn't start any after that. Why do you think? Okay, okay, we're talking Billy, Eric, Joe. Why do you think there are a lot of pitchers or a lot of players are getting injured now? You think because of, you, yeah, you're talking about pitchers. Yeah. Yeah, everybody. I mean, there's pitchers getting injured. I mean, they go on the shelves. Uh, you know, the first time they pitch in spring training, you know, right off the bat, you know, they throw a little bit harder. And now all of a sudden, you know, their elbow goes. They're, you know, they, you know, I mean, paying these guys a hundred million dollars, I have no idea before they, you know, get a hundred million dollars. I, I can't believe they they don't check every muscle in their body with <laughs> us. When we're oh. pitching well, we're trying we're trying to get a five hundred to a thousand dollar a year raise. I mean, they they telling us we didn't get this guy out on the eighth inning, or we struck out with the guy on third base. You know, I mean, these guys. You know, I mean, uh, what do you think? Why do you think they're getting injured as much as they, much of the as now? Why are they getting hurt so much? My theory on that is not so much that the players are falling apart. I think the medical profession at this point, when it comes to athletes and professional sports, are so much more attuned. There's, they know more. And they will get a guy out of there before he becomes a disaster. Mm-hmm. Right? So the knowledge, the knowledge of the body – there's so many people involved in the health of the players right now that if a guy, hey, it's, it's just not feeling right, well, they'll skip them on this one and not take the chance of it becoming a major injury where you lose them for six weeks. So I think that's part of it. Um, I think now uh, players are stronger. I think players are more attuned to their bodies and what they can do and they know their body speaks to them. And I always felt that I, I mean, as, as an athlete, at least I felt I did, I could, I listened to my body the best I could. My injury, my major injury with, uh, with my elbow, which required the Tommy John surgery, when that tendon goes, (laughs) you know, you don't have to be a genius to know you can't throw the ball anymore. And that's, that's what it was. That was a, a serious injury. But I just think guys are more attuned to their bodies and uh, the trainers and the medical staff. They're, they're required to get those guys out of there. When, when teams are investing so much money in certain guys, they don't want that guy out there trying to limp through it. You won't see a Billy Buckner out there again. Teams won't allow that. You know, Joe, Joe I'd like to ask you a question. You, um, um, you had an injury that was so serious um, that you told, told me that, you know, you thought it was probably over, um, that your, you know, the, your all-star career was probably o- over with. And you come back from that. And then, you know, you're pitching in the American League Championship Series in 86, and then you're pitching in the World Series. At any time... When you were out on the mound, say in the World Series, you know, before a 55 share on TV, you know, the, the, the biggest television audience ever to watch the World Series at any time, did you stop yourself and just take it all in and think back to when um, you thought it was over and now 
you know, you're under the brightest lights in baseball? You know, Eric, I don't want to say I didn't. Pitching in the World Series was really kind of the, I got to the peak. I got to the uh, summit, we'll say. Uh, I wish we could have won, obviously. But I want you to know that every day that I went to a stadium and put a uniform on and got to go out on that field, I felt that way. Wow. It, it was – baseball was so ingrained in me from the time I was a little guy. And that was the thing I wanted to do more than anything else in this world. And when I got the opportunity, when they told me I was going to the big leagues, when I finally got that chance to get on a big league mound and face a big league hitter, I mean, <laughs> not that I had anything I can brag about in that first outing, but um, – or at least that first inning that I pitched. But that's what I was shooting for. That was my life goal. And, and I was fortunate enough to where things worked out and I got a chance to do it. And I know how fortunate I was to have had that chance. And I never, a day never goes by that I don't think about just that. And thank God for, you know, how lucky I was. When you when you play in the big leagues, when you play in the big leagues, whatever team you're on, and you put that uniform on, and you go out on that field, and let's say you're 20, 21 years old, and you look at the stadium, and you look at the scoreboard, and I don't know how Joe felt, but the way I felt when I played up in Yankee Stadium, and I'm an 18 year old kid and I put it on Yankee pinstripes and I'm going in the old Yankee stadium and you, you feel like, you know, I mean, it's, you, you're on another, you, you're on a different cloud. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Joe probably felt the same way. And, yeah. and you know, if, if you played in St. Louis, if you played in Detroit, Houston, wherever, when you put that uniform on, you made it, you made the big leagues. Yeah. And you, you look at all the people that actually, you know, you know, I mean, Joe would tell you that when he was in the minor leagues, he'll look at guys and said, that guy's not in the big leagues. You know, yeah. this guy is doing great. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, but you're at the right place at the right time. And I mean, there's so many athletes, if it's football, basketball, hockey, whatever. One thing that athletes are missing a lot of great athletes, they miss in their heart. You know, I mean, they don't have this. They're not willing to take an extra uh, swing or extra uh, uh, throwing a, uh, another bullpen and, and, you know, extra couple of laps. And, you know, I mean, it takes that extra effort to reach that goal. And, and once you are lucky enough to play minor league baseball and then get that call to say you're coming up to the big leagues, Joe will tell you. I mean, when they gave him that call and they told you going up to the big leagues, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you just, you know, I don't know how you felt. My heart felt like it was just stopping. And I'm, I'm saying I'm going up to New York. Where was your first, where was the first, uh, 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 where were you, where did you go to your first oh, game? Glad to, glad you had. Uh, ask that question. I was told, I was told when the manager came to, you might remember Jim Beecham. He was my manager. Oh, sure, Beach. Right? Yeah. He was my manager at AAA. He came out to the mound to take me out of a game where I'd just given up the third home run of, of the day. My, you know, gave up seven runs, seven earned runs, and uh, came to the mound. He said, uh, I, get, I just handed the ball to him. I said, sorry, Skip, I just not – didn't have it today. It was a hot, muggy Sunday afternoon in Charleston, West Virginia. And he said, that's okay. You're going to the big leagues on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he said, uh, but your roommate's going with you too, Dan Larson. He said, now I want you to get off this mound – and you don't say anything to Dan. And then I'm going to call you guys into my office after the game is over. I'm going to chew your asses out. 
and we'll have a little fun with Dan. And that's exactly what he did. He called us in the office and uh, um, he got on us both. He said, I don't know what's going on with you two guys, but I don't like it. He says, I don't know if you're just not working hard or whatever, you don't care. And then he, then he mentioned that we were going to the big leagues. So it was great. <laughs> oh, and by the way, we went to New York. We, it was, oh, you uh, did. this was the Sunday before all-star break. And, um, and we were going, uh, I guess on Wednesday, I think might've been Wednesday. We flew to New York together. And they didn't even have the cell phone back then. No, they didn't. And, and I also remember Beecham telling us, and don't give me any back talk. You're getting on the bus with us back to Memphis. 15-hour trip. He said, you're not a big leaguer yet. <laughs> <laughs> so. Hey, Joe. Yes. Joe, I, I wanted to ask you, um, uh, you, you know, you, like you talked earlier about how, um, you know, you treasured every moment, you know, that you were out there on the field as a big leaguer. And – you know, Ron, I know that you've said the same, same thing. Um, and, you know, you speak glow, glowingly about your play, playing days. But for you, Joe, what was it like when Tom Seaver was traded to the Red Sox and now he's your teammate, you know, traded in the middle part of the 86 season, and now you've got Seaver and, you know, you're a local guy here in New York. Um, you know, and you're now teammates with someone that you idolized. Can you talk about the dynamic of that a little bit? Well, that was, uh, yeah, it was just another one of my, uh, one of the things that happened in, in my very fortunate life that Tom Seaver, he was, he was the king of New York back then, you know, in the sixties, I was the late sixties were my high school years. And, um, we had uh, my high school team. Uh, we were all a bunch of Met fans, and the coach. Uh, I guess w when the Mets won in '69, and I still had one more year left. That was my junior year, so we had one more year left in high school. Every everyone who was on the team got an alter ego nickname, which corresponded with. Um, a player on the Mets from okay. the 69 World Series. Now, I was left-handed, and our other st uh, major starting pitcher was a right-hander. So he he became Tom Seaver. I was Jerry Kuzman. <laughs> and uh, and he uh, the coach, he would uh, post, uh, when we had games, he would post on the bulletin board outside the phys ed office, uh, baseball game tonight or baseball game today, um, Kuzman pitching, uh, and it uh, versus, uh, Mineola, whatever, you know, so, <laughs> so, uh, we had, we had a lot of fun with that, but then when Seaver, you know, I, I recognized, of course, that Tom was the star of that team. And I learned a lot from him, just watching him. He was a, he was a machine and, and he had, he had the picture perfect delivery and, yeah. You could learn a lot just from watching him, and I did. And um, he was always my guy, my idol, we'll say. And when he, when I found out we had him coming to help us, it's like this is great. You know, I, I'm a little kid again in the candy store. Um, so that part was fun. Um, uh, talked to him a little bit about that. You know, being a a high school kid growing up in New York when he was a star over there. Um, but it was fun to watch him as a teammate. And one of the best stories, and I think you're shooting for this one here because we talked about it. Um, in Tom Seaver's first start with the Red Sox, um, I was brought in at the end to try to save the game. And I did. And so his first game as a Red Sox pitcher, he got the win. I got the save and I had him, I asked him to sign the ball. It was a game ball and, uh, and he did. And I still have it. Wow. Yeah. Eric, this is, I want to talk about your book because your book is coming out in two days. Yep. 
how did you actually, you know, I don't know if you are a Red Sox fan, you know, you are from New York, am I right? Yeah, yeah. You are from New York. What made you decide where the Yankees hated the Red Sox, okay? We hated, we hated more, t- we, we hated those guys, okay? You decide to write a book about that. 86 uh, 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 Red Sox. Yeah, no, well, so, you know, it's my seventh book and um, I write about stories that transcend the sport. Um, So I don't necessarily write about um, a champion like, you know, like Derek Jeter, a bad day for Derek Jeter when he was playing in New York, you know, he might you know, a trip over a supermodel's pumps on the way to get coffee in the kitchen in the morning. You know, like that was a bad day. Um, I, I like the struggle. I like overcoming challenges um, or dealing with adversity. Um, I, you know, so my books aren't about statistics and, and game sum, summaries. Um, I like the human element. And um, so I, I wrote... Um, four books that were Mets related. And it really began because I was approached through my agent to do a book with Mookie Wilson. And so from Mookie, I did a book with the 86 Mets, Kings of Queens. Davey Johnson loved the book and he said, you're the guy to do my autobiography. Um, And then um, um, Art Chamsky wanted to do a book on the 69 Mets for the 50th reunion of the 69 championship team. And I'm like, you know, God, there have been so many books written about that team. Um, You know, we need an angle. And that's when uh, we thought up the idea of, of, you know, bringing Kuzman, Swoboda and Harrelson with us to visit with Tom Seaver for that final reunion of Tom's life when we knew it would be the last time they would all be together. And before that, I wrote a book with Steve Blass, who pitched for the Pirates. And my first book was with Glenn Burke, um, a former Dodger player who died of AIDS. And uh, Jamie Lee Curtis uh, bought the options to my book and is making a movie. You know, so really, I go to where the stories are. So with the 86 Red Sox, I was in Boston those years. I, I went to Emerson College from 84 through 80. Eight, and I was working in the media for the CBS affiliate in Boston, and um, I, you know I, I was reporting on the team, and uh, I was going to fifty or sixty games a year. I'd open up my bedroom window, and I could hear the national anthem play. And that '86 Red Sox team has always intrigued me because no team in baseball history has enjoyed the highest of highs and the lowest of lows within a two week period, more than the 86 Red Sox. I mean, they were a one strike away from elimination against the Angels in Anaheim. I mean, the, the police were on the field. Joe, Joe will tell you, you know, you know, the guys in the dugout couldn't see the field because the uh, police officers, you know, they, they were dealing with crowd control that they were anticipating when the fans would run on the field. I mean, it was over and the Red Sox make this incredible comeback with the home runs by Baylor and Henderson. Um, Then the Angels tie it up and then it looks like the Angels are going to win, but the um, Red Sox bullpen holds them and then they end up winning in, I think, the 11th inning. It goes back to Boston and then they really, I mean, the Red Sox, I mean, the Angels just couldn't come back and the Red Sox just bulldozed over them back in Boston. And then, you know, a couple weeks later, the Red Sox are one strike away with the two run lead. Mets have nobody on. And, you know, Mets stage this incredible comeback um, off of Chiraldi and Stanley. And, um, uh, and then the Red Sox have a three nothing lead the next, uh, a couple of nights later with Hearst just stealing. And the Mets come back in that game too. And so I wanted to write a book on the effect that the, you know, those highest highs and lowest of lows had on those Red Sox players. Um, You know, not just 
for the rest of their careers, but the rest of their lives. And what I found was I had some highly emotional interviews, um, you know, with Bruce Hurst, certainly with Wade Boggs, um, those stand out, you know, even Roger Clemens, uh, Rich Gedman uh, was very emotional. And I think it adds so much to the story when I traveled around the country to visit with these guys in person, you know, wherever they lived or worked or, you know, some of them are coaches now. Um, so I could get what they were feeling, you know, a phone call wasn't going to do it. You know, I wanted to read the emotion on their faces, in their voices. And I think it makes for a powerful book. And, and that's what I did with the 86 Mets book. I mean, you can imagine, you know, talking with Dwight Gooden about what could have been, Daryl Strawberry and Lenny Dykstra about what could have been, you know, had they stayed away from drugs and alcohol and, um, and with the Red Sox, you know, how um, some players thrived after they left the Red Sox and won championships elsewhere, whereas others like Bruce Hurst admitted to me, you know, you're 36 years old and you're retiring from baseball because you're too old for baseball, but you're still a young man in the real world. And that's a very hard thing to overcome. And I've interviewed probably hundreds of former ball players, and they all tell me the same thing, that it's so hard to adapt to, for, to civilian life. You know, to, you know, you're playing before 50,000 fans a night for years, and then that's over. And um, so, I mean, we have two former ma major leaguers, you know, you and Joe, Ron, I mean, it's hard, isn't it? Oh, I mean, it's, you know, you know, Joe would tell you, when you play athletics since you're a little kid and everything is, uh, you work and work and work and you play and you play and play. Uh, once in a while, you might do a little bit of schoolwork, but you're out there every single night till nine o'clock, baseball, basketball, or football, whatever. And then all of a sudden, uh, your age, you can't do anything about age. And then you can't do anything about your body. Your body breaks apart. It's nothing you can do. It's nothing you can do. And then all of a sudden, you know, you like, uh, uh, you know, you look it out a little bit rather than look it in. And then you get injured. And now all of a sudden you try to make a rehab and somebody's behind you that's hitting 20 home runs in the minor leagues. And they're, you know, number two on their prospect list. And you come into spring training just to try to make it. You know, I mean, and then all of a sudden, the manager calls you in with the uh, GM or the president of the team, and they sit down with you. I'm sorry that we had to let you go. And you, you, you say to yourself, this is not really happening to me. I don't know how that felt about you, Joe. But when they tell you, I know, I know you feel like you can't do it. But when they finally tell you that you're not going to do it, it's, it's, it hurts a little bit more. I mean, then you start thinking, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? Uh, you know, I'm not getting that paycheck on the first and the 15th every, every single more. I'm not going to be making road trips anymore. Uh, I don't have those baseball bets anymore. I don't have a traveling secretary to do things anymore. What am I going to do? Yeah. Did you feel that way, Joe? I mean, no, my, I felt that way. You know? Yeah, mine, mine was different. Mine was a little different, but I, I certainly understand you know, when it uh, blindsides you. You know, maybe you shouldn't be blindsided if you're not, you know, you, you're 36 and you're just not producing. But I was about that age, but it had gotten down to, uh, I was a triple A. And the, what happened was I, I went into camp with the Astros in 1988 and it was make or break. And I, I had the understanding with the Astros that, um, you know, I either make the team or I'm going to call it a day and take it home. So I, I guess I was prepared and it came down to the final weekend and the Astros broke camp with one lefty in the bullpen. And it wasn't, and it wasn't me. And I was really kind of surprised about that, but Al Rosen 
called me into the office and he told me, you know, we're going to, we're taking one lefty and we don't really know what we have in there. And you pitched well in spring training and we'd like you to go to AAA. Now, I wasn't too, cra- wasn't too crazy about that, but I, I just figured if, if indeed that's all true, and I felt I pitched well enough in spring training, I'd be hurting only myself if I said, no, I'm not doing that. So I said, okay, I'll do that. But I do want you to know I will not play the entire season at AAA. You know, I think uh, next four to six weeks, we can tell if I'm pitching well, I'll stay there. I'm not going to walk away from an opportunity to get back to the big leagues. But um, uh, I ended up going to AAA, and I started out pitching quite well. I mean, I, I was doing a good job for probably the first six to eight weeks. And, but nothing was happening up top. And um, it finally it gets to the all-star break and I started feeling, you know, things weren't working right. Shoulder was barking at me and my hand, you know, because with the Tommy John surgery, I ended up with some nerve issues which controlled my hand and I was getting pain, shooting pains into my hand and it just didn't have it all. But I faked it as much as I could, meaning go out there and pitch. And if you keep getting guys out, then they're happy. So that's what I did, but it got down to the all-star break and um, I was hurting too much. And I called, I called the, uh, the Astros and I said, look, it's come down to put up or shut up. And um, if I can't be on a big league roster, whether it be yours or someone else, when we come back from the all-star break or when play resumes after the all-star break, then I'm leaving. And that's not to threaten anybody, but it's just to give you an opportunity to make alternate plans if you need a player here to replace me. And, and that's what happened. I, I remember the final game that we played, which would be on the Sunday before the All-Star game. All-Star game. How ironic that I, I was brought up at the same time my very first year, you know, the All-Star break that, that Sunday. So um, I then left, left Tucson, and I remember walking to the gate at the airport, and I stopped and I turned around, literally turned around as if to look at where I was. And, and – it was like a calm. If this is the way it's going to end up and I don't have another opportunity by Thursday, then I'm okay with it. And then, you know, so I guess since I was the one who walked away, it's a little bit different than getting that called into the office and them telling you they don't need you anymore. It came down to where because of my arm, it was easier for me to say, I don't need you anymore. And so I, that's what that's what that was it. I went home. I got a couple of calls to go back to AAA with other teams, um, but nothing at the big league level. And I knew that was it. Joe, I uh, I want to ask you a question on that. You know, you um, you thought that you were out of the game a few years before that, um, and then you know you you work your way back. And then you have that magical season in Boston where you go to the World Series. Did that somehow prepare you um, for almost like a second um, point in your career when you thought it was over and, and you, know, you decided that it would be? Well, maybe, maybe so. I'm trying to think, uh, you know, how to answer that question, but the fact that I did get to the World Series, again, so thankful for that, you know, that it all just kind of came together. And here I find myself in the World Series when I thought I was done. And so maybe because I had gotten to the World Series and I was able to make another check off my bucket list, yeah. it was easier for me to turn the page and, you know, go back to real life. That's yeah. really what it was. And, See, it was yeah. hard for me because in 77 – uh, I was injured, and when the team, well, when we won the uh, uh, championship, 
American League Championship in 76, I was on the DL, okay? I was injured. In 77, I got injured again in spring training. So I missed the whole year. So they went to the World Series. Eventually, they beat the Dodgers, okay? And I'm on the, you know, I'm on the team, but I'm not on the team. But, I mean, that's, uh, see, I wanted, I, I wanted to feel to be part of, you know, I mean, being part of a major league team is one thing, but trying to reach your, you know, your, the, the major thing and to reach the uh, 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 pennant and then eventually reach the World Series, that's what you want to reach. But mm-hmm. unfortunately, I did not do it on a playing time. I got it on the DL time, and I didn't want to leave it like that. I didn't want to leave it like that. I wanted to win. I wanted to win. I wanted to have that place. But uh, even to this day, you know, uh, I start thinking about, you know, I'm reminisce about your time up in the big leagues, about the good times and the bad times. And I know Joe thinks about this. And I know that you got wonderful friends that, you know, after your career is over with, we had wonderful, wonderful friends. But I don't think that people nowadays, and I go down to the clubhouse and I go to Old Timers Day and I see these guys and they're all different. They're all spreading out differently. They're not together like we were. You know, we went out to dinner with these guys. We, we rode to the ballpark together. And, but it's changed, you know. But I gotta say one thing. We made a lot of friends and it's been wonderful. And Billy, are you bored listening to all this stuff or are you taking it in? <laughs> oh, no, it's great it stuff. In? Great stuff. No, I mean, uh, I wasn't around Find back the then, so it's great to hear about that, you know? Well, you know, I mean, it's, uh, but I want to talk one more thing about your book, you know, Eric, and, you know, with the, uh, uh, with uh, 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 your last book with the Mets, it was wonderful. I, I read half of it. I did not read the whole thing because okay. my, uh, 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 I would tell you right now, I usually read like a half a chapter and I get bored and I look at the back of the book, but this was so good. And, 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 and Sham was telling me so much about your trip to uh, California with Saber and Coos and it's for Boulder and, you know, Coosman and, and, you know, Coosman, you know, I mean, he's, he's a little cr- uh, uh, quirky and, you know, and, and, and then, and then you get Strabona, you get those two people fighting with one another. I mean, and then you get, you know, and, and uh, unfortunately you get uh, a buddy and a buddy was sick and, and stuff. And, uh, but uh, you get these guys and, uh, you know, I mean, hey, you know, and with this book, which you have written, it's going to come out on Thursday. I'm excited about the book. And I mean, are you getting so many great plays with it? And I'm really excited. Well, every book that you've done, every time I go to Barnes and Noble, I see Eric Sherman, you know, the, the king and queen. I mean, you know, every book you have, it's, it's wonderful. And I'm, I'm so proud of you, big guy. And uh, you deserve it. You deserve it. Hey, one day, HOF, right? The Baseball Hall of Fame. One day, <laughs> it's going to be close. It's going to be close. I hope so, because you're that good a writer. And I hope you do. And it's, it's going to be fun to read and stuff like that. And, and with Joe and stuff, meeting him for the first time and watching him. And I mean, I'm so honored, you know, I mean, just to do these things. And, you know, it's really, really nice to meet. A, you, you got a small fraternity. And with Billy, the bat boy, one day we're going to be on our assistant living. And, and then all of a sudden we're going to be turning on the screen. He, he's going to be with ESPN and we're going to be watching him and say, we remember this guy uh, 10 years ago. And we're with our, uh, uh, with our walker and a hover around and our cane and everything like that. And we're watching you on TV. We remember <laughs> this guy. And I hope you remember us. I hope you remember us. But it's fun. It's fun. And we really enjoy this. And, you know, uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, you want to say anything else about your book and, you know, uh, I know you're going to be doing Zooms and stuff. Where is your first Zoom that you're going to be doing uh, 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 with your book company? Well, I'm actually going to be doing uh, one. Um, well, I'm going to be doing a bunch of them with bookstores. Um, 
So the best thing, you know, like you said, there's a whole bunch of interviews that go along with the release of the book. Uh, the best thing that people can do is to follow me on Twitter um, at, at by Eric Sherman, B-Y, Eric Sherman. Um, my website is ericshermanbaseball.com. Uh, or you can follow me on Facebook at Eric Sherman Baseball. Joe, what do you have, big guy? Well, like I said, my son is playing high school baseball, and um, unfortunately their pitching coach passed away oh. just before the season began. Really? So I reached out to the head coach, and I said, I know you have a void to fill, and I'd be more than happy to come over and see if I can teach you boys a few things. And wow, they're lucky. So I, uh, yeah, you, uh, I'm going to be doing that now, you know, as the season, oh. I don't know, the season goes till the end of, uh, let's see, it goes into May. Yeah, it goes into May, early part of May. It'll be done. Now you're in California now, right? Yes. Is that open up out there or can you, yeah, can you have I parents mean, our, to go out there and stuff? Our area, our area was, uh, did pretty well through this whole thing. And I know I, I just read something. We just elevated to a new level of getting over it. Uh, I don't know how to phrase that. But they now, uh, restaurants can open to a higher percentage of occupancy and uh, indoor dining and things like that. So I know baseball that. season starts on Thursday, right? I know that the uh, is actually the first game is Thursday. Is that the first game Thursday? Who opens think, up first? Who's um, the opening game? Uh, it's different than when I was a kid. I don't. I don't really know. But I, uh, Thursday is the first game. I know the Angels open up on Thursday against uh, White Sox. At home. White Sox are in Anaheim. Well, they say going to be playing baseball. I know that the Yankees got twenty percent of uh, occupancy. Uh, they got ten or 11,000 people going to the game. And usually we were at the stadium this time of the year, but I don't think it's going to be uh, – we're going to be doing anything. And old-timers day usually in July of August. Uh, we haven't heard anything, and I don't think it's going to be enough people there. I think if some everybody goes to the game, somebody sneezes and stuff, they all be going running out. You know, everybody's going to be having no idea what's happening. So I think it's going to be another year, you know. Work, but, on, uh, work on your immune system. Well, my immune system is good. I mean, yeah. I work out every single day. I mean, I go to the gym and, yeah. and you know, down in Georgia, it's a lot different than what is up in right. New York. Right. Uh, you know, we've been like open up about 75 to 80 percent, you know, since last year. And we don't see it as much, uh, you know, but a lot of people got it. Uh, fortunately, I know a lot of people got really hurt by this and a lot of people, uh, a lot of friends and family passed away. And, you know, I mean, this is the worst of the worst. And this one reason why I started this, just to have the, the fans to be able to listen to this and to smile again and for me to smile again and to rejoin with the fans. And this has really been fun, Joe and Eric and Billy. And this has been fun and I love it. And I met some wonderful fans, new fans and whatever. And also I got a new book that's coming out on uh, the 20, uh, the 20th of uh, uh, April uh, called the captain and me about Thurman Munson. And I'm looking forward to that. And it's going to be great and stuff like that. And when is your book coming out, Joe? You know, my <laughs> wife said, my wife said to me yesterday that I should write a book. I Everybody said, does. <laughs> I said, no, I don't think so. I, I just, that's a, that's an awful big project. I'm not sure I'm the one to do that, but I don't know, maybe, maybe uh, some famous author. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> <and say>, <laughs> collaborate. <laughs> never know. Never know. Oh, you got a prospect, Eric. You got yeah, a prospect. Okay. Yeah. Got a prospect. The, the question is, you know, who cares, you know, or do enough people care that, that could that could be something. Maybe in, you know, maybe fans, in my little circle. Fans love baseball. Let me tell you something. Fans love baseball. They love stories. 
They want to hear like fly on the walls. They want to hear locker room talk. That's they don't want to hear the, okay, Jose Canseco's where you're killing this guy and killing this guy. Nah, they want to see the plays and, you know, the fun that we had in the game of baseball. You know, this is fun. I mean, hey, you know, I mean, we had a great time and we made some great friends and there's great fans out there. Like you said, hey, the fans are the heroes of this. I lived a fantasy. You lived a fantasy. You got to, you, you lived what you wanted to do. We're very lucky to do what we got to do. And I'm so happy. And to do this and make some great friends and to meet Eric and to meet you and to meet Billy, this has been wonderful for me. I mean, I love it. And, you know, Lenny has, you know, Lenny Cosberg has, and Joe Garrido has started this and, and John Francis you know, they're the best of the best. And I love them to death. And, you know, hopefully we're going to keep on going and going and going till I can't do this anymore. And people will look at me and, you know, with, you know, going to old Thomas day and I'll be the first one in New York city uh, hitting the baseball and running around first base on a hover round, you know, one of those, uh, uh, you know, hover rounds going from home to first. And, yeah. you know, I'd be on the back of the page of the New York times and the daily news. It'd be fun for me. It'd be fun. <laughs> But again, you know, I know that we have to go and stuff like that, but I love y'all, you know, anything y'all need for me to do, anything, Billy, or Eric and Joe, anything that you need for us to do, I don't know what we can do. We got a, we got beautiful fans and stuff, but anything that you need from us, we're here for you, you guys. Thanks so much for inviting me. Let me tell you, I, I don't know if I've ever had as much fun doing something like this, not that I ever did a Zoom, but you know, any kind of interview, this one, this one's number one. I really enjoyed this hour. Oh, we love you. I mean, you're wonderful. I mean, you know, when, uh, uh, you know, got to know you and got to see you and, and, you know, played, uh, I grew up in the greatest golf course in the world, Beth Page. I mean, you know, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, yeah, you can't get any better than that big guy. You can't get any better than that. Yeah, it but, killed uh, me a few times. Oh, but you got to play up there. It's gorgeous up there. No, Not I in the wintertime with the Northeastern. But, you know, Billy, living in Jersey, got the $25,000 equipment and, and whatever. What are you going to have next time? And Eric, you know, all this is success in your books and stuff like that. You know, this is going to be a winner. And I'm really looking forward to it, big guy. And, uh, hey, it's the best of the best. And I hope once this season uh, starts, we'll all get to meet, you know, somehow, somewhere. You know, uh, you know, we'll, hey, we, we know that we're part of the family. Baseball is a small, small group, and you're part of the family, and we love y'all all. Uh, thank you, Ron. Thank you very thank much, you. Joe. Thank love you, you big guy. You be safe. Be careful. Billy, you're the best. Eric, congratulations on your book. Can't wait till it comes out. It's going to be very successful, and you need to do a book with Joe. Joe would be Joe would be good at this. I oh. mean, Joe has a lot of good stuff. People want to know about this stuff. Hey, he gave you a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> gave you a little bit. Of, hey, Billy, you know, it'll, be, it'll be good. Good luck to you. Good luck Billy. to y'all, Joe. Thank you. I appreciate it. Billy, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, big guys. Thanks, guys. And we love you. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.